So everyone is going to have a talk now by Jens Eisner, and um, here we go. <laughs> well, <laughs> thanks. Welcome back. Thanks for the kind introduction. Thanks for the invitation, and thanks to the organizers for all the effort and sweat of setting up this splendid workshop on challenges in quantum computation. And well, this is what this talk will be about, or actually rather more on the challenges than on literal quantum computing, in that we have a look at a specific ramification thereof, namely that of analog quantum simulators, in a way the, the dirty brothers of quantum computers. So, but I will try to advocate that there are still devices worth thinking about, that they're quite exciting devices and sometimes um, underappreciated. So I was specifically asked by the organizers to say something about what, uh, what we have, what we would like to have, and the potential for seeing quantum advantages. This is a challenging prescription, and um, well, uh, I will obviously not be comprehensive, so I will ask lots of questions um, throughout this talk. Like, what is a, an analog quantum simulator in the first place? Then what are relevant problems? And uh, when and in what sense can we hope to uh, quantum simulators to provide some kind of computational speed up over classical computers? This is far from being, being obvious. I mean, for, say, full, short class, full tolerant quantum computers, the speed up issue may be out of question in that they could presumably solve some NP problems in polynomial time. And we've seen and we are kind of witnessing uh, very exciting um, activities towards actually building such devices. We will hear a talk tomorrow by John Martinez on realizing like superconducting qubit devices up to like 50 superconducting qubits. That's very exciting indeed, but well, this is large by some measures, but it's not the, the full short class quantum large-scale quantum device that we, that we hope for. On large-scale devices, however, the, the one thing we do have as of today with present technology is, well, quantum simulators. So large-scale devices that offer a high level of precision and control, but not quite enough to be universal computers. So, I mean, that's the dirty brothers of quantum computers. But they're one thing. They are large. So the, the asymptotic limit is, in a way, already <coughs> been built. But then loads of new questions pop up. So I, uh, I mean, analog quantum simulators are made to simulate interesting physics uh, problems. But in a way, they're just simulating themselves. So they are surely not BQP complete. So what is the precise computational power of such analog um, simulators? Then error correction, let alone fault tolerance, will be out of the question. So is this, is this a bug or a feature? Meaning, does that necessarily mean that we are just swamped with noise and they're all just solving uh, problems in P? Or is there some sort of inherent robustness so that at least in intermediate times and space regimes, there's something potentially interesting coming out of that? I'm not necessarily having answers, but there's um, important questions that, that we um, should pose here. So, Clearly, man can quantum simulate loads of things, but there's most point to the idea of a quantum simulation if one simulates problems for which there's good evidence that we could not have done otherwise. So in, in, in one way or the other, we would like to solve problems that are inaccessible to classical computers, so they should solve hard problems in a certain sense. So let's assume one day I go to, into a lab and <coughs> Well, that was a joke. Somebody else goes into a lab um, and performs a quantum simulation that's presumably interesting, meaning for which there's some evidence that is pro solving a, a hard problem of a kind. And then this person performs a delicate measurement at the end, and the outcome is five. Is this correct? Well, how would we know? It's not an NP problem. So. Um, uh, uh, so how can, we, how can we, it be claimed that a system has been successfully simulated? And how can we even think of having testable advantages of a certain kind? And while I do not necessarily have question, uh, answers to that, this, this will be kind of the, the guiding questions throughout this talk. And these are questions that we um, have to have answered in a way. 
Good. So analog simulator. So any simulator is clearly an analog simulator in that it's, well, it's in the nature of a simulation that it's analog to the real thing. But analog simulators are analog, analog, like not being discrete, right? So like analog classical computers. Now, quantum analog simulators are basically made to probe interesting physics questions, not so much quantum chemistry problems as was hinted at in the previous discussions, so made to look at interesting physics problems of, of, of a kind. So here's a kind of a minimum requirement set what it could, could mean. So there's clearly kind of a system size coming into play, like N that governs like how large a system we can address. These will usually be like local Hamiltonian problems that have some sort of knobs that you could tune in the lab that require some level or give rise to some level of control. There's surely some noise levels that can be assessed and, and, and characterized, but there's surely no noise ever. And what is important here that there's only certain class of preparations that are conceivable, and more importantly, even certain kinds of measurements that can be done at the end of the day. So this is usually a very strong limitation in an analog simulator of what kind of readout one can meaningfully conceive in a practical um, setting. So the most advanced such architecture is that of cold atoms in optical lattices, so um, stand, uh, um, artificial lattices made from counter-propagating laser lights, like an egg carton where the, the carton is the, the light and the eggs are the atoms just sitting there um, one by one. Now I'd like to Cite Ian Wormsley in this context, he was once after a talk asked whether this protocol he was just showing could also be done in the asymptotic limit, whereas he said, we are experimentalists, we are not asymptotic people. Um, yet this is kind of different in that this is asymptotic in the sense that one has access to very large, like 10 to the power of five, even 10 to the power of six sites and atoms in um, today um, experiments in 1D, 2D, and, and, and 3D. One can load bosons and fermions into such a lattice. There's some tunability in the sense that one, one can look at super lattices, flashback resonance, so there's some knobs one can turn to probe that systems under certain different settings. There's time of flight measurements, that's basically like a Fourier measurement on the full thing, and in situ measurement, which means that one can measure on site, say, sample atom numbers um, at the end on site. So where's the input here? Well, I mean, there's progress on realizing programmable such potentials. This will come up soon, like in Emanuel Bloch's lab, which is an interesting um, further perspective of, of a kind. Then next on the list is that of trapped ions. These are way smaller, like 20s up to 53, an experiment that will be reported on, I think, um, tomorrow. These are devices where one has pretty much universal control, although one, some gates, some global gates, like Mölmer Sörensen gates, are easier than others, but one can do, in principle, a universal set. And also one can gain tomographic knowledge at the end of the day. Say with compressed sensing techniques, one can learn about the state at pretty large system sizes, which we just did with a, with a blood group. And so one can basically read out um, the system at, at the end. So these are the, the most well-known architectures. There's also optical microtraps that come in large tunable arrays, but they like long-ranged easing in a way. There is polaritonic and photonic architectures which are very exciting, they are very tunable, but they're also intrinsically open and, and very noisy, so they're kind of Levillian simulators if, if, if you want. And we will hear by Misha, who's sitting here tomorrow about um, trapped cold atoms in Rydberg states, which are in a certain sense programmable, which is again an exciting um, perspective. So one of the problems they can probe after all. So very natural problems are like time-dependent problems, like quenches where you go into the lab, have a state initially prepared, and then you look at the time evolution under longer and longer times generated by some uh, local Hamiltonian probing questions of equilibration, thermalization, and how temperature, say, comes about in, in the first place. Now, a picture that like, I like to show in this context because it shows the kind of paradigmatic setting that we have in mind. Here is this one 
Here that shows the result of a kind of dynamical simulation of such a kind, um, which shows the setting where you have prepared in a basically a one-dimensional setting, the initial situation of 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 prepared in the lab. And then one looks at the time evolution under a strongly correlated Hamiltonian for longer and longer times and looks at the number of odd particles as a function of time. Um, <laughs> And um, there's initially no odd particles at all, and then you have some non-equilibrium dynamics, and for long times, maybe unsurprising, just half a particle uh, per cycle. Now, there's a lot to say about this experiment, and ask me maybe later, because that's quite interesting, but for the purposes of our line of thought, it's interesting to see that this picture not only shows the result of a dynamical quantum simulation, but also the results of a classical Resimulation is not a fit, but a classical simulation. That's the blue curve, and that fits. Um, that um, is a very nice um, agreement. The point is that this is not just some simulation, but it was run at the time on the fastest algorithm that's available for that type of problem, based on matrix product states. It was run by the on the fastest computer the German taxpayer can afford in the Jülich Supercomputing Center, and it took like five weeks of runtime to generate a plot of, of this kind. So this is kind of the the upper bound of a of a publishable result of that kind, and that's very nicely working for sh short times, even with error bars if you want, but there's a certain point where even with, with 5,000 by 5,000 matrices, you can no longer go on because for the entanglement growth, one cannot faithfully approximate the state anymore at a given instance in time. That generates an interesting situation that, well, the experiment, of course, runs on, and um, one can ask better physics question on the dynamical simulation and can use this classical re-simulation um, as a way to build trust in the functioning of the device. I don't want to say verification, but build trust in the functioning up to a point, but the experiment runs on and in a mild way outperforms the, the classical supercomputer. Of course, one should be careful. I mean, it's not so difficult to think of like mean field fits or so of a kind, but there can be two fallacies here in the sense that one doesn't want to reproduce just one plot at a time, but a full functional dependence, which is harder. And also, it's also not about just retrodicting what is there, but also rather having predictive power of what comes out at the end of the day. And this is a much more challenging prescription. So these are dynamical problems. Then one can think of slow parameter variations of a type that are reminiscent of adiabatic quantum computing, looking at kibble zurich type settings, which one can do in 1D, where one can classically re-simulate everything with all details, but the quantum simulation can be in 2D. One can look at ground state problems, and the holy grail here is that of the Hubbard model that's thought to play a role in high temperature superconductivity, where the issue here is really to cool it down to the, the to cold enough temperatures to see like long range order, but there has been significant progress um, recently in, on that type of endeavor. Or many body localization where disorder and interactions come together, where it's debated whether this MBL phase even exists in 2D, where again one can check everything nicely in 1D, but the experiment can be done in, in, in 2D in just the same way as, as before. So the upshot I'm trying to make here is that these are kind of baby steps, obviously, but baby steps in an interesting direction in the sense that there are certain regimes that are classically verifiable and like short times can be efficiently simulated, long times not. Or in this kind of kibble zurich type setting, in 1D one can completely re-simulate things on a classical computer, even with full error bars, but not two-dimensional systems on a classical computer, but quantumly one can perfectly do this. So this is sometimes underappreciated, but one should be aware of the point that existing quantum simulators already outperform state-of-the-art classical algorithms run on classical supercomputers in, 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 this, in, this, in this sense. Um, so this is a, a, a very interesting kind of baby step in, in, in the right direction. Of course, one can argue, fine, it's, it, this is very interesting. But there could always be a better, a better algorithm. And I mean, who are we to say that this kind of, you outperform state-of-the-art algorithms, but there could be a kind of a, a better way of, of, of looking at it, and a clever simulation method. So how can we be sure against this kind of devil's advocate argument of a type? So 
to be safe against a lack of imagination, one would like to see some sort of hardness of a task in a complexity theoretic sense. So presumably one would like to have some, a, a look at some sort of intermediate problem, like which is say outside BQ, BPP, but not BQP complete, so that like some problem that can be realized in the lab under natural settings, which however shows some sort of speed up of a kind. And this brings us to the question of like achieving super polynomial um, speed ups of, of, of a kind. So this is um, kind of the, the concept uh, previously known as quantum supremacy, also, although I realized that this word is coming a bit in this favor. So here the, at stake is to have such some problem that's realizable in the lab, no matter how practical or, or, or like applied that is, to just show some problem for which there's good evidence to have a speed up over classical computers in a complexity theoretic sense, no, 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 matter, no matter what. And one of the seminal papers in that direction was on so-called boson sampling, which is a, it's a cute, simple, relatively simple prescription where one thinks of having bosons and sends them through a random linear optical multiport and samples from the photon number distribution at the end of the day. And that's interesting because the distribution, this random distribution obtained in this fashion um, is so intricate, although um, uh, random, so that one cannot resample this on a classical computer to a great accuracy or precisely when a sampling from a distribution close to an additive total error in the total variation distance is computationally hard or would lead to a collapse of the polynomial hierarchy if this unitary in this algorithm is chosen how random and the number of photons is scaling appropriately with the number of modes. Just, 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 just to clarify, we don't know that that collapses the polynomial hierarchy without some additional conjecture. Yeah, indeed, I will come to that in a second. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, indeed, under reasonable complexity theoretic con um, assumptions, which I will come to in a, in a minute. Indeed, absolutely right. And this, I mean, this may not be very scalable experimentally, but this was a key seminal paper in the sense that it not only set the setting and also the complexity theoretic assumptions that I will come to in a minute, but also introduced some nice proof techniques that we will hint at at least in a, in a second. Now there's also um, IQP and random circuits. I understand that we will hear a bit more about this um, tomorrow morning. There is easing type interactions that are maybe closest to spirit in what I'm going to say in a minute, although they rely on settings that have a unit cell of 56 qubits. And while this is paradigmatic and very interesting, one can argue that if you have a unit cell of 56 qubits, that's not really meant to be a, a practical scheme of, of a type. So, um, so there's questions. One thing is, how can one, how, how can one think of verification in, and testing in such a setting? Like black box verification seems out of a question. That's maybe not so surprising that with polynomial in many samples, one cannot distinguish such a device from um, one that could be classically efficiently um, emulated. So one has to think a little bit um, harder in, 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 when verifying such devices. What is more, even though this is way simpler than thinking of universal quantum computers, these are still very, very intricate and challenging prescriptions. So, um, so is it possible to scale such prescriptions up to provably hard regimes in architectures that are close to quantum simulations of a kind that we have just, um, just advocated? What is a provably hard regime? Well, this is the, the regime I come to that. In the setting of um, similar assumption of the type, which I will mention in a second, to have a kind of a, a setting where you cannot resample the problem up to constant error in the total variation distance. I come to this in a second. So, I mean, this is what you, what you want. You want to have a kind of a boson sampling type setting, which kind of combines the benefit of both worlds, where we want to see a kind of a, a quench type architecture. So it's some sort of scalable architecture, but that should not involve like, um, like complicated Hamiltonians or 56 qubit unit cells or so, but you want to have a Hamiltonian setting like with nearest neighbor or at best nearest neighbor situations that you look at, but where you get hardness proofs 
with the constant L1 norm error under certain assumptions I will come to in, in a second. This is what one would, um, would like to see. And I'm using the next five minutes to say that such architectures indeed exist. One can think of such settings. Some involve randomness, others don't, but for reasons of time, I will only um, briefly sketch the one thing on the left that does involve some kind of randomness. It's a very simple prescription. What one does is that one has a square lattice and initially prepares that, these qubits on this lattice initially in a product state. There's some randomness involved, but there's no correlations um, whatsoever, so one can think of this as being the ground set of a disordered Hamiltonian if you want to, but it's just a, a product state initially of that setting. Then one looks at the evolution in time under local Hamiltonian, but not some complicated Hamiltonian, not a 56 unit cell or whatnot, but just the simplest Hamiltonian I can imagine, namely a nearest neighbor easing Hamiltonian. And not also for long times, but for one unit of time. It's a unit depth circuit, if you want, um, applied for one unit of time. Now this cannot only be done with um, present technology, but has already been done. This was one of the earliest experiments for called atoms, the, these controlled collisions that were done that even predated the cluster state computers, the one-way computing that the, the one-way computing comes out of the discussion of the, the cold collisions in these optical lattice experiments done on hyperfine levels. So it's basically implementing an easing Hamiltonian. So you do like one unit time of Hamiltonian, and then you measure all qubits in the X spaces. You just sample from them. Now, experimentally, this, I mean, single side addressing is possible, but this has to be done quite accurately. So this is presumably the, the simplest, uh, the, the most difficult prescription, but the over scheme is as simple as it gets. You prepare product state, one unit of time of a nearest neighbor Hamiltonian or a unit depth circuit with commuting gates and just sample at the end of the day. There's no other randomness, no gates involved here. Whatsoever. And the claim is that under three highly plausible complexity theoretic assumptions, I say that in the second, one cannot efficiently sample from the outcome distribution and our scheme up to constant error in the L1 distance. That's similar to the setting in boson sampling, but in kind of in a scalable Hamiltonian fashion of, 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 of this kind. So I have no time to go into detail of the argument, um, about 22 minutes, but I will say a few words on, on, on how this goes. Like to give a bit of a bit of hint at, at, at the argument, so there's no gates, no random unitaries, no measurement, no adaption in the in the scheme, but one relates that setting to a measurement-based computing setting, a post-selected MBQC setting where measurements are being done in the XY plane, which is in turn is related to a random circuit with T gates, Z gates, control Z, and Hadamards that are being done, which is a universal quantum circuit for um, which is a post BQP um, um, complete setting, which already means that it's sharply hard to approximate the output distribution of a kind. But you don't want to approximate the output distribution, but you want to show hardness of actually sampling from that distribution. That alone would already say that you cannot sample from that distribution up to small multi multi multiplicative errors, but that's not very physical. So under Further assumptions, namely of um, anti-concentration of the distribution and on, on an average case complexity conjecture, one can use the machinery of Stockmeyer's algorithm to make beef up the error you can tolerate from multiplicative errors to reasonably physical additive errors at the end of the at the end of the day. So for the published work, this was an assumption, but in the meantime, we worked harder on actually proving the anti-concentration bounds for certain settings of that type, and also one, some leverage can be done on average case complexity, a nice, nice work by Umesh, where we also sat down recently together with Adam to see how this um, can be combined. So this together shows that you can do that up to additive errors in the total variation distance. One cannot resample from that distribution, so that's a setting where um, you can do like a, a quench setting in the lab under a, just a Hamiltonian setting, yet you cannot sample from a distribution up to an additive error in the total variation distance on a classical computer of a kind. So this is a quantum, well, simulation if you want, that's intractable on, on, on quantum computers, in a, but in a kind of nicely scalable um, fashion. But it has another beautiful feature, I will say at the very end, which is the following. Namely, it's in a very nice and, and strong way 
verifiable, which is a kind of acute aspect of this. In, in the following sense, so one can just go into the lab and make order n measurements of a kind, and this will not just build trust in the functioning of the device or build some evidence that one has done the right thing, but the quantity measured directly bounds the, the trace norm and the, actually the L1 distance of the final distribution that enters the complexity theoretic argument. So this is kind of interesting in the sense that one would go into the, the lab and perform a measurement, and if the noise levels are too high, then one would say the noise levels are too high, and then one has to, the red light goes on, and one says, oh, we have to abort because it's not, not the right thing. Um, Can you explain how that's possible? Oh, indeed. Um, because that's, that's actually, this part is not very deep. It's like, the point is that this is a, a ground state of a fictitious um, frustration-free Hamiltonian. So basically, the, 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 it's not so much the, the, the verification that's so interesting, but the fact that you can do a scheme of that type with a unit depth circuit. So what you ultimately do is you think of this as a, as a, as a unique ground state of a frustration-free Hamiltonian. So you can do this locally by just measuring local Hamiltonian terms one by one. And if this fidelity is large enough, you can unambiguously state that the overall state must be close in trace norm to the right state, and that you can infer to the, to the, as a bound to the total variation distance. That's only possible because the depth, the, the circuit is a, a short circuit, a unit depth circuit, and then the verification is basically not so, is, is not so. You're, you're relying on the assumption that you're in a ground state? No, I'm not, no, no, no. I'm not relying on the assumption. The point is, it, it's, it is a ground state, a fictitious Hamiltonian, but I, I repeat measurements, and then if I get sufficiently many times a sufficiently close value to the right thing, you can, you can, um, upgrade, you can uh, argue from this that you're close in total variation distance for the full state. I can give you, you have lots of discussions time afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Mm? Does this, um, it seems it requires uh, trusting that your measurements are performed correctly. Is that ah. what you mean? Okay, good. I mean, I can come to that. It does make some assumptions, but not too strong ones, in the sense that one can, the whole thing is true up to additive errors, so to the extent that you do some sort of, that the, you can, relate that error to the, the measurement error to the state error, then you can still accept some errors of a kind and one can also bound the errors you can tolerate. Yeah? But it's kind of cute to see that um, that's a setting that's because you do a unit depth circuit that you do measurements sequentially of local measurements and from that alone, also accepting additive errors on the measurement device if you want, you can infer that, well, if the noise levels are too high, you have to abort, but if th this measurement, including measurement errors, would be close enough to the right state, you can get green light and you say, but then that means that the distribution you get is necessarily close in total variation distance to the real thing, which is a, a, it's a cute um, property to have in this, this kind of setting. So you do measurements, and then it's a, it's a setting that is kind of, in a very stringent way, um, verifiable. I should say that this idea also would work for the superconducting devices. We're just talking to, to Sergio um, that um, this is a, a, a nice feature to have. So this is a challenging prescription that the measurements should be not so inaccurate, indeed, but surely it's way simpler than fault tolerance and it's, it's a very stringent way of a verification of a kind. Okay, good. Which brings me to the, so here is the, is the point. So this is a, a prejudice that's often aired in the, in the physics communities that, oh, yeah, in order to be able to verify a quantum simulation, one needs to be able to efficiently verify it. And, and plausible as it sounds, I mean, this is fortunately not true. I mean, there's delicate settings where one can verify quantum devices in a certain way, even if the classical simulation is, is beyond reach. So also in the verification setting just outlined, you would get numbers, and if you get a green light, you would say, oh, then the sampling distribution is right. And you say, but what is it? Well, you don't know. You have to go into the lab. So <laughs> that's kind of cute to see that the verification of a device is less than predicting the outcome. And in particular, in physics communities, that's not, un not appreciate that this is something less and that you can verify the functioning of a device even if you cannot predict what comes out at the end of the day, which is important to have in mind when thinking of analog and quantum simulation. Which brings me to the end of my talk because I don't want to overrun, but we have still time to discuss um, in the, in the, in the uh, there is time. Um, so we have looked at analog quantum simulations, the, the dirty brothers of quantum computers. Um, we would like to m know more about them, and that's what I'm trying to advocate there. We looked at certain platforms of them and looked at interesting questions they can potentially probe of time evolution, slow quenches, and ground state problems. And 
it's important to stress that already present day quantum simulators, they've been called atoms, do outperform the best known algorithms for the same type of problem run on classical supercomputers. This may not be the end of the, 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 the story, but it's already interesting that for physicists, that's already often enough what they want to hear, <laughs> interestingly. Yeah. Anyway, um, to be safe, one would like to have some sort of feasible quantum simulator for which one can make a claim of a super polynomial speed up in terms, in, in a language of computational complexity. And we also have had a look at, at um, in, the, in this talk, we looked at a scheme that is interesting in the sense it's not fault tolerant, but it can be kind of certified in a very stringent and nice um, sense. It can be seen as a kind of a, a bell test for quantum computing. So even if the simulators exhibit a quantum computational speed up, there's still a strong sense in which one can verify the, the functioning of the device, which is a kind of acute um, property to have. This is nice. However, one should be aware of the fact that there's still a bit of a discongruence between the, the physical schemes that are physically meaningful and interesting and the settings where one can prove something in terms of a language of computational complexity. So we kind of bring these worlds a bit closer together, more structured problems, look at MBL problems, disordered problems that for which one can prove something which are closer to the ones um, that, are in, 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 that are interesting from a physics perspective. Then the question of robustness of quantum simulators, I didn't say so much about that, but that's of course an interesting issue. Important issue, the readout, one is often very limited in the way one can read out quantum simulators, so that's something one has to work more on to, to, to make um, progress here. And in the end, maybe it's interesting to see that there's kind of a trade-off between space and time in, in, in any, any quantum algorithm. In this setting, it's kind of cute to see that this kind of space and time trade-off can be brought to the extreme in the sense that the scheme is one that only has space and no time because it's a unit depth circuit being applied, it's, but a, a large spatial system, a unit depth circuit for which one can still show kind of some sort of speed up of a kind in, in that setting. Which brings me to the end of the talk. Thanks for your attention. I'm looking forward to the questions you might potentially have. Yeah. You know, I remember hearing about this, but you have very few primitives. Yeah. You have this Hamiltonian. Very good. Mm -hmm. Z, side, pi over four Z. Mm -hmm. You have these little rotations you do on the qubits, mm -hmm. and you end up in a state which you mm -hmm. claim is the ground state of a Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. Could you show us what it is? Of course. Please. No, no. Find it on the board. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, that's very easy. Um, because, I mean, I can. Is there? Ah, very good. I mean, the point is that's very simple. In the tensor picture, you would have a. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, look. Look, it's just a, a product state, and these guys are random from, like, IID random from. They're chosen. They're chosen? They're randomly chosen, but chosen. They're fixed. You fix the randomness, and that's what you have. And then you do a kind of a circuit of the kind. You can see this as a kind of brick layer thing. They're all commuting, so the order doesn't matter, right? Because that's an easy Hamiltonian, but it, you can trotterize it or just see, think that of a unit depth circuit of that kind, right? There it is. You do this in 2D, but it's the same thing. No, no, just do what you did. Yeah. Okay, and then you get a state. And then, look, I mean, the, the fact that, that this kind of certification is possible, that it's a fictitious ground state, is in this picture obvious because, look, what you get in this form would like in 1D, if you contract that network, would be like a, if you write it like that, it would be in matrix product state of bond dimension two, or in 2D, it would be a PEPS of bond dimension two, just contract it in. Okay? No, no? okay, look. Yeah. No, I would be much happier if you wrote down the Hamiltonian that it's the ground state of, because you have the Very primitives. Good. Oh, you okay. You have the Hamiltonian H, which is the sum of the Z, I, Z, J, plus um. I, pi over four Z, you have okay, in, 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 in um, okay, look, um, this guy is the, um, th okay, this is the, the uh, uh, bond dimension two matrix product state, okay? Every matrix product state is um, a ground state of a Hamiltonian. If it's an injective um, MPS, i say about this in a minute if you're interested, then uh, it would be the unique ground set of a, of a Hamiltonian. This would be a three local Hamiltonian. So what it basically, if this, look, I make it simpler. I do just that, zeros. Zero plus one, okay? Because that's the same idea. Okay. Same thing, and then you have a kind of, this guy would be an easy Hamiltonian, like a ZI, ZI plus one, this guy. And then what this is, is basically like an XI, ZI plus one, 
ZIXI Hamiltonian, basically. It's a three local Hamiltonian, and of that, it's the, the unique ground state. Basically, your verification is by doing tomography on three three sum particles. Exactly. And then making sure that this is the unique ground state of that amino. Precisely. And then the distribution comes out of this. Exactly. In the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the interesting bit, it's not so much that you can do, I mean, once you acknowledge that this is a matrix product set or a PEPS in, in one dimension two, then that you can do a verification by measuring the fixed hematone. That would also work for 2D. If I had the same in 2D, I would get basically like an X, Z, X, Z, X, X Hamiltonian. Okay, this is not so deep, say. But what is kind of cute is that you have a setting where you just apply a unit depth circuit that I gives us. No, no, but here it is. Okay. Good. Wait, mm? but yeah. Just, yeah. Uh, mm? I understand that you're saying the initial state was product state. Therefore, yes. it's a ground state of some one local Hamiltonian. Yes, very much so. Evolved by constant depth. Oh, yeah. Therefore, the Hamiltonian is still local. Thank you very much. It's exactly. It's just conjugated. Then your verification circuit is the inverse of the whole protocol. Exactly. They verify the initial state. Yeah. Yeah, if, you, if you want, you can say that. Yeah. But the point is, it's a local thing, right? You can just measure it. Yeah. But, but I mean, but it's, 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 I mean, it's extremely simple. You just you conjugate the Hamiltonian under the thing. But the point is, if you get the, measure, the right expectation values, you can still write it in a weak membership form to really say that you're absent close to the, to the right fidelity. That's why it's possible. Yeah. There still seems like a hidden assumption here that I'm trying to tease out. Is this, is, are you assuming that there is a single global state, which is the same state regardless of which observable you're measuring? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 But it's yeah. a. No. Yeah. No, but uh, yeah, yeah. I'm not. But, but say, say it again. Um, we thought about. Well, like when Alex and I thought about verification of boson sampling, like th that would not have been an assumption. No, no, what, 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 what's the assumption? No. Uh, that, there is, you know, that there is a single state. So in other words, you know, if we just think of the quantum computer as a black box, right? Oh, but this is, this is the point. This is, I mean, no, no, I insist. No, 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 no I, I insist. Well, I'm the, I'm the uh, author. I'd like uh, him to finish before you. Oh, indeed. OK. All right. Hmm? It's not just cooking up an answer in response to each measurement, you know, basis that you ask about, you know, but rather it has to commit to a single global state, which then, you know, the uh, expectation values of all of these measurements will be calculated with respect to that state. Ah, but the, 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 that's important to, to stress maybe. Maybe I wasn't clear enough in the sense. Because the point is that one is not assuming that there is a global state. Right? But one takes measurements, and the only state compatible with those measurements is that global state. Yeah. So there's no additional assumption. Unless there were a different state each time. But, all right, well, no, but there isn't. Well, no, 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 there isn't. That's the point. You take measurements, and for each, measure, for each setting, no. there is only one, one state that's compatible with that type of measurement outcomes. Uh, Jens, yeah. uh, what about the right. following situation? You've got an exponentially powerful no. classical computer that okay. knows the value of every measurement that you're going to do. It reads in the button setting that you're pressing for it, and then it outputs statistics that are comparable to that. There is no quantum state in that case, and it will be entirely compatible. Oh, no, no. That's the point. Haha, <laughs> that's another interesting point. Uh, that's an interesting point. Um, but I first want to um, uh, convince Scott. Have, uh, do, do you see what, I'm, what I mean? Because I come to that in a second. Oh, yeah. I mean, I because think, in the, okay, I said very. You're making the assumption. I think you treat the assumption as so obvious that it doesn't need to be stated. Which oh, no, no. Which may be, depending on the experimental setup, maybe. Oh, no. You think you're making it. Okay, but then I should say more clearly what I say. I'm making the assumption that the measurement apparatus I'm using, like the local Hamiltonian terms, yeah. are kind of, in a way, characterized that they don't have to be perfect, but they're close enough so that I can accommodate this with an additive error for the total thing. This is the assumption I make. The measurements have to be somehow not too bad, but that's always the case, right? But the, 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 I'm not making any further assumption in the sense, I, I, I say it again, that for a specific setting, I make measurements and I get outcomes. And the only, this is very important to stress, and there's no further assumption that the only state that is compatible with the measurement outcomes is the state that you have. There's no other state. I'm not making a uniqueness assumption so on, but one can show that the only state which is compatible with the outcomes is the one that is correct. If you get. If you ask for a single state. Right. So that doesn't mean that this state is in the machine, right? I think, right. I think you're talking. I think we're, yeah, we're, we're, we're talking past each other. Okay, but then let's talk more about this later. Right.
Nathan's okay, Nathan's question. Okay, good. Um, I was just trying to give an example of something that was closer to what Scott was saying. Yeah. Oh no, no, but I mean, okay. But the, the, uh, the thing is that just because you know that you're st you look. Okay. Um, okay. The, what you, you make measurements, and what you could infer about that measurements, there's only one state, one quantum state that is compatible with these measurements, right? Okay, good. And this you can verify and you can do, but from that more knowledge alone, you would not be able to classically sample from the distribution that you would have obtained by having that state. That's a, 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 maybe your point. You, that doesn't allow, if you do it all in a classical computer, of course you, I mean, expectation values can be easily computed. I mean, even in your head, it's just a one step cellular automaton. Of course, they can compute all kinds of Pauli expectation values. That's very easy. But the, the, the lo higher tails in the distribution, I cannot. I cannot, just from the fact that I can sh write down the state as a PEPS, doesn't mean I can efficiently sample from it on a classical computer. And that's what we show you cannot. So that's the interesting distinction, right? That's also at the heart of the boson sampling, that writing down the state is, is, is a triviality. You can still not sample from it. Right. I think maybe the buzzword uh, that we're looking for here is device independence, right? With ah. boson sampling, we try to give a fully sort of device independent prescription of what you do, right? Here is the input. Here's what the output is supposed to be. You don't need to know anything about the internal state of the device. You can just test, is the device solving this problem? Oh, you but know, this, yeah. Giving you this mapping from inputs to outputs, or mm -hmm. is it not? Right, and then the problem would be to verify that, right? So when you say verification, you know, you don't, you know, mean this device independence because, again, you are assuming some, you know, you know, at the very least that, that, that there is a single in, internal state of the quantum computer which does not depend on which measurement was chosen. Okay, so it's a, you know, I mean, I mean that's fine. Okay, but, uh, okay. But I just, no, no, but, okay, but in this sense is quite similar to, to, to boson sampling in the sense, Okay, but we, we discuss that later. Right. But I mean, also in boson sampling, because the, 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 I mean, your measurement devices must be well characterized, so it's not device independent no, in that no, setting. No, because if, if the boson sampling is being solved correctly, then you don't need to know anything further. It's device sure, but independent in a sense that this isn't. But all right, we can. Well, well, but uh, let's settle this. Yeah. 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 Can I say, yeah. I think John Law said again, if you don't mind, you know, yeah. starting out with a state, which is, let's say, pointing with all the states. Yeah. Very good. So it's the ground state of the sigma. Axis. Sure. That's, mm -hmm. You're then performing a simple unitary. Yeah. Which, so that you are now in the ground state of yeah. that thing conjugated by that yeah. unitary. But since the, the effect of that is to produce a local Hamiltonian, yeah. you can check the local. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And, but can you do that for IQP2? No. That's the, I mean, that's the, the, the setting. I mean, the, that's all the whole point here is that what we did basically is to just strip, find the simplest scheme for which an, an argument along Scott's lines is possible that has precisely the, the construction that you have. If you do an IQP circuit, also if a deep circuit, then. Well, IQP is not deep, it's one layer. Oh, I mean, okay, good. No, no, I mean, indeed, this can be done. I mean, a similar setting can be done. If you double the setting, you can, you can do something similar for IQP as well. Also for the random circuits. But IQP is the same depth as you. Yeah, yeah, good. You can do that too. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, yeah good. I have a much more naive question. Oh, oh, yeah. I just want to understand the relationship between the hardness of sampling to generic thermalization. Oh. So if I take just a generic random product state yeah. and a totally generic Hamiltonian that thermalizes, or that you know, ultimately I expect statistically. You mean locally thermalizes in the sense that local expectation has become as if the global state was Gibson? Precisely. Is the statement that everything you're making about the hardness of sampling out of that distribution? should also apply to any generic Hamiltonian that thermalizes on a generic product state, and that that's just hard to verify, or is there something deeper about the set of problems that are hard to sample? Oh, that's a d deep question. I mean, you, you, are, you have a bit limited in time, but let me, let me don't get me going. Like, there's a couple of things you say. First of all, do systems thermalize, right? I mean, that's something I've worked on a lot. I mean, there's a lot to say. I mean, you cannot quite prove it, but there's one is almost there in the sense that if you have a sufficiently clustering of correlations initial state and then you have a sufficiently generic Hamiltonian, which is local, then one should expect that for most times the in trace norm, the reduced state would look as if the entire system was thermal, reduced to the subsystem. That's kind of what you say, right? Um, this is not fully proven, so then yeah, it, it's what it is. Then you can say, can you do Gibbs sampling? Um, yeah. 
this will presumably also be kind of uh, as a sampling problem. No, no, I mean, you, you would do this and then you would say, can I sample from the state, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, okay, probably the answer is yes, but I mean, these settings are delicate in the sense that it's not so easy to find some sort of uh, uh, hardness proof. So probably yes, but um, uh, the, 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 the devil will, will be in the detail of actually proving it. But it's an interesting setting. But it's not the most uh, natural of all settings because you're making so many assumptions along the way that it can be hard to make progress here. But it's super interesting as a setting. I, I agree. I, we should talk more about this. Okay, we'll have another one or two questions because yeah. this was stimulating. Yeah, thanks. Two, yeah. Um, okay. As I understand it, basically the, the state you're preparing is a closure state with local rotation. Well, almost, yeah. Like it's yeah, it's basically like a cluster state. So the Hamiltonian be a sum of stabilizers for cluster state. Yeah. yeah, almost, yeah, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <coughs> looking at it, it seems like it would take 1,600 qubits or more to see a, to see a hardness of simulation because you just directly simulate the uh, unitary operation, right? The, the deep circuit rather than the shallow circuit. Um, so you'll be making an assessment like on how, how large the system has to be to... If you have a 40 by 40 grid, yeah. then mm -hmm. you only really need to simulate 40 qubits. Right. Ah, okay, good. So in this, okay, good. You're talking about the, the, the overhead. Okay, there is some, something to be said. The short answer of this is, i make it short. So you can do this, or it was also hinted at, if you want to have a random circuit of size 40, you can also do it with two times 40 or so. Then this strong verification is still possible. If you're not happy with the quadratic overhead, you can do it and you still have that, that kind of verification. If you're happy with a square speed up, as you say, if it's 40 by 40, what it effectively be is like a random 40 qubit set setting, which is nice if you want to have like translation variant settings where you have just one Hamiltonian um, as a translation variant thing, that needs that type of setting. In many architectures that's plausible, then squ squaring it seems an acceptable price because you have fully translation variant and that's it. If you want to be delicate and have like tuned circuits and don't like overheads, then you don't have to have overheads. So both is possible. You can do a square thing, then you get an overhead as you rightfully say. But then you are fully translation by the, in the, in the many body setting that's very plausible. If you don't want that, then you have a random circuit. So absolutely right. We had one more question. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a question about this, this dispute. So like the, the, the difference between the strength of the verification assumption compared to Spotsworth is that you assume that your measurement operators act as described up to some tolerance level, which is either 10, 2, 3, 4, whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. no, no, but uh, no, 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 that's not it. I mean, no, um, no, but let's discuss that. I mean, in, in any, any of these schemes, you have to know something about your, your measurement devices. That's not what, what Scott meant. But I mean, that's more delicate. We can have a discussion. It was very stimulating. Yeah. But it's not that. I mean, of course, you always have to know something about your devices. The difference is that in this scheme, there is an assumption that there is a global state. Right. Global yeah, indeed. They, they, yeah. uh, although I am not fully happy with that, um, that way of putting it, because you don't, again, but the, we discuss that more later. For, for the measurement outcomes, there will only be one state that is compatible with them. But let's discuss that more. Okay. But this was interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and now we have.